Doug pitched me a murder mystery set in the museum um, that was going to be called Zero at the Bone. And um, it wasn't all that good, but that wasn't his fault. It was because um, murder mysteries were a dime a dozen. And I told him that. And um, I suggested that we write a thriller, a techno thriller, a la Jurassic Park, set in the museum, which is the ideal place um, for it. And it was then when I, as the editor, um, suggested chapters, and Doug took the burden of writing most of those first drafts in the early days, that I saw him take these ideas and spin them out um, to, to uh, in, into living, breathing chapters. And, you know, I'd, I loved to write when I was a kid, but I'd lost that interest in, in uh, as an English major and as an editor. And seeing Doug add humor and eccentricity, as well as just, you know, effortless writing to these ideas, it rekindled my own interest in writing. Pendergast, his creation was quite mysterious. Uh, what happened was I wrote the first two or three chapters and I sent them to Link. And he called me up and he said, Doug, these are great. I love these chapters, but you've got these two detectives, this Irish American cop and this Italian American cop. And he said, really, they're both the same character. So I think you ought to merge them together. And then I think we ought to come up with a totally new and different and fresh detective. And uh, <laughs> by this time I was really annoyed at his advice, unwelcome advice. So I said very sarcastically, oh yeah, like you want a detective like a, an albino from New Orleans. And Lincoln said, well, let's work with that. <laughs> let's, let's see where we go with that. And we started talking about this crazy detective from New Orleans, who's a fish out of water in New York City. And uh, uh, within 15 minutes, this character of Pendergast started to materialize in front of us, sort of like Athena from the forehead of Zeus. And I would say one thing, and then he'd say another thing. Oh, he loves, he's, he's a wine connoisseur. He's wealthy, he's extremely eccentric. He wears black, um, he's very pale. Uh, when he shows up at the crime scene, people think he's the undertaker because he looks like because he looks like one, and on and on. And that's how Pendergast was created. And I, I wish I could tell you where his name came from, but I don't remember where the name came from, to be honest. Link, do you remember? No, except I'm I'm positive that in those early days you made up. I made up Margot Green and you made up everything else. Pendergast, D. Gusta, Smithback, they were all yours. My main interest, I read a lot of horror um, growing up and ghost stories, and I felt this was the creepiest building in any city, really, was the Natural History Museum. And I wasn't particularly interested in the New York Museum per se, but a similar museum that we could blow up parts, you know, and and have terrible things happen. And we have free reign because it's a fictitious environment. And Doug, of course, knew about all these strange places like the, the dinosaur bone storage room and, you know, the whale eyeball room. And so we used all these as backdrops for the museum, as well as um, the weird characters who work there, you know, the, the curators who never see daylight for 30 years, as well as the pith helmet wearing Indiana Joneses who come in and out, and one of who brings in something terrible, you know, and causes. We did not want to stray over into the realm of horror and supernatural, but we came awfully close. Um, and, you know, the kinds of things that are hidden in that museum and for various reasons are not on display, um, just made it that much easier for us. I had so much fun uh, writing those scenes in the museum. I mean, I, you know, the behind the scenes storage rooms in the museum are absolutely incredible. They've got whale skeletons 
hanging in these huge spaces, garages. And Lincoln mentioned the whale eyeball collection. Uh, they've got gorillas and vats of formaldehyde, giraffes. I mean, they've got crazy stuff, minerals and gems. Um, under, you know, the, the, big, the largest meteorite in the world is in the museum. And it's so heavy that it has to be anchored to the bedrock underneath Manhattan. Uh, so it's held up on these giant steel pillars. So there's, and there's, there's a room full of flesh eating beetles that the curators use. They, if they have a dead animal, like the museum has contracts with various zoos. And so when they have a dead animal that dies, the museum wants a skeleton. So they send the dead animal to the museum and they put it in this room and these domestic beetles then eat the flesh off the bones, leaving a nice articulated skeleton. So, so we just, both Lincoln and I love this environment and we created uh, this novel set in that environment. It's all very accurate. There's nothing in the novel relic that we really made up. Uh, we moved the geography of the museum and the rooms around a little bit, but we didn't make up anything up. <laughs> We collaborated almost 100%. Um, and that's one thing we've learned about. We've both written solo novels and joint novels. And we've learned that joint novels, while you have to split the dough, are easier in the sense that you have somebody else to brainstorm with and you know shoot the whatever with um, and figure out how to work things out. And in that early book, Relic, we hoped it would sell, but we weren't sure. You know, I mean, I knew from being the editor how one in a thousand books gets published. So we were very self-indulgent with that story. Um, you know, we we had subplots that interested us. Doug got a chance to air some grievances and settle some scores. Um, <laughs> um, and we got to add all these strange rooms to our fantasy museum that didn't really exist. Um, but then when we turned it in, that was only half the battle. Then our agent had to shop it around literally for years. And we have some people who loved it, but they were the people who had the purse strings. And when we finally sold it, the person who bought it, bought it with the, um, proviso that we would have to edit down 30 percent so we learned not only from each other what worked but also what didn't work and how then we were faced with okay we have to take this subplot and take it out or cut it down how do we fix it and so it was really a crash course in in writing um in in, in every possible way the administration of the museum was pretty annoying to me. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I did settle some scores. And I guess I must have uh, hit some targets there because later, uh, when they made the movie of the relic, uh, the president of Paramount Pictures went to the museum and said, we would like to film in the museum and we'd, we'd, we'll pay you a million dollars or millions of dollars to film in your museum. And they said, absolutely not. That's a terrible book. We hate that book. Why, we, why would we ever want that filmed in our museum? And that's why the relic wasn't filmed in the New York Museum. It was filmed in Chicago. But I'll add a little addendum to that. I was walking through the halls of the museum after Relic was published. And I ran into the director of the museum. Uh, and he said to me, I greeted him. He greeted me. We knew each other, of course. And he said, oh, Preston, I just have to tell you something. I'm so sorry you don't work for the museum anymore because I would really love to fire you for writing that book. Yes, as a matter of fact, the book that Lincoln edited was called Dinosaurs in the Attic. It was a nonfiction book about the museum and how they collected all this great stuff and the history behind some of these weird objects. And they're still selling it in the in the bookstore. In fact, it's still in print, I think largely because the museum bookstore sells tons of many copies of that book. It's probably the only bookstore in New York still selling that book. So um, it's had a life, a long life. 
the idea germ was entirely Doug's for that. I'd never even heard of D.V. Cooper. Um, um, and so the the base for that story in D.V. Cooper was his. And, um, you know, I added Mike Garner as, as we went along, but he was the one who said, hey, Link, how about this? It was strange because I've, I'm like you. Uh, I've been thinking about this mystery for a long time. And I used to think, you know, this, there, somehow there's a novel in here. Somehow you could take this D.B. Cooper and assume he survived, right? And make a novel out of that. And also, but it's gotta be a surprise, you know? So we decided, Lincoln was really important in this part of, you know, even though I came up with the idea, it was Lincoln, I think, who said, well, maybe he wasn't after money. Maybe he was after something else. And this whole thing was just a, a, a fake to make it look like a hijacking for money, but he wasn't after money, he was after something else on that plane. And uh, some, some hand carried luggage sitting up in one of those bins where he gets everyone off the plane, they can't take their, their you know, carry ons with him because he wants something on that plane. And uh, anyway, so that's how it started. And the funny thing about that is that what Doug just was alluding to, which I won't, I won't go into detail about, but that hand carried luggage is still um, a monkey on our back today, basically. The book we're writing now um, would not exist save for what's in that suitcase. And we would never have known that at the time. What was in that suitcase turned out to be something absolutely uh, wild. And now this is the third book, which involves what's in that suitcase. Of course, we can't tell you what it is, sorry, but. <laughs> uh, the cabinet of Dr. Lang um, had turned out to be, again, as we mentioned before, a sequel when we didn't think there would be a sequel. Um, the, the prior book ended um, in a way that we didn't think it would at the time, uh, Bloodless, um, which, which, which tears apart the poor city of Savannah, which Doug and I both love. And we realized that this gave us a chance. The, I mean, the ending of Bloodless, the surprise ending gave us a chance to um, wrap up a story we began with Cabinet of Curiosities in terms of Pendergast family, Diogenes, you know, the, 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 in the 1880s, all this stuff, we could finally wrap it up. And we realized that there was a Dr. Lang, the, the evil genius who was first mentioned in Cabinet of Curiosities and who has thrown a long shadow ever since. Um, we could button that story up finally. And it doesn't happen in Cabinet. In fact, Cabinet ends on, on in an even more difficult place than um, Bloodless did. But the book we are writing now, Angel of Vengeance, will finalize that and sum everything up. Of all of these threads we've been carrying along, some um, consciously, some unconsciously, sum it all up in what we hope is a very satisfying way. Again, you know, we don't we didn't plot these three books out to start with. You know, again, this is a story and the characters hijacking us and taking us with them. Um, and it 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 starts with that thing in the suitcase, which turn which leads to, you know, when when DB Cooper jumps out of the plane. He's got his $200,000 and he's got this thing in the suitcase and he, he lets, he throws the money away in the air when he's coming down with a parachute so that it'll look like he crashed and died. That's the whole point. He doesn't want the money. He doesn't care about the money. He's got what's in the suitcase. And so that thing in the suitcase then of course is the centerpiece of, of that book. And then the thing in the suitcase um, then generates the disaster that occurs that wrecks Savannah. 
but there's no there, there's no resolution there um, because Constance uses that thing in the suitcase to get herself into all kinds of trouble. And then Pendergast has to go after her. Uh, again, I can't go into details, but it's like Lincoln and I are writing the story and it's like, wow, we're being sucked into this world that we created. And yet our, it's our characters who are leading us into this world. And it's, it's Pendergast, it's Constance. And now we're finally wrapping it all up with the Angel of Vengeance. Uh, which we're having so much fun writing. It's very complicated. We almost wrote ourselves into a corner, but we've managed to write ourselves out of that corner. And in so doing, we came up with a really fabulous, I think, wrap up to this whole thing in the suitcase, which at the end of, of Angel of Vengeance is destroyed. What we came up with a few days ago, as Doug refers to, will be one of those rocking chair memories of ours um, in 10 or 20 years, no doubt. Um, we finally put our foot down and said to our characters, you're not carrying us any farther. We have to wrap this up. And so pay attention. We're going to kick butt here a little bit. It'll be the end of the sub-series that began with a cabinet of curiosities. But... Pendergast, Constance, the Augusta, the, the rest will soldier on in some form or another. It's essentially a quartet, um, you know, like a trilogy. It's a quartet, starting with Cabinet of Curiosities and then moving on to Bloodless, uh, the Cabinet of Dr. Lang, and finally, uh, the Angel of Vengeance. We had had a series prior, a second series, that our publisher suggested we write starring a character named Gideon Crew, who would, it would be a simpler, more linear series, easier to follow, less Baroque, um, with lots of action, um, and uh, with a character who's got uh, only a, a ticking clock. And um, we ran him through five or six books until we found a, a good place for him to, what well, seemed like a good place for him to end. And I believe, and Doug, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I suggested that, that, we, that we put him to bed and instead create a series with our two favorite female sub-characters, Nora Kelly, the archaeologist, and Corey, the FBI agent, because not only could we show two powerful women showcased, but they have complementary talents and they could be set in a in a place in New Mexico, which Doug knows very well. And they would be they'd make a great series because they are they are um, characters that all of our readers really like, if not one then the other. And we've had a lot of fun making stories very unlike the Pendergast stories, very action oriented, but still present child books centering around their partnership. Uh, Corey has now become an FBI agent, Agent Swanson, and Nora, and she's now working for the uh, Albuquerque field office. That's where she's been assigned. And Nora is now back at the Santa Fe um, Archaeological Institute as a curator. And so the two of them uh, are often, you know, team up on these cases. You know, a, a, a body will be found or a skeleton will be found. For example, the first book is, you know, a mummy is found, an old you know, skeleton. And uh, so Corey is assigned to investigate as an FBI agent, but she needs an archeologist's help in order to excavate the body to make sure it's taken out properly, that the evidence is preserved. And so these two find themselves working together in New Mexico. And the wonderful thing about New Mexico is it's a state with a lot of history, a lot of buried treasure, rumors, there's the White Sands um, missile range. Um, it's where the first atomic bomb was tested. So there's all this great history that we can, and that we've been uh, digging into with this series. And uh, it's really fun. And the one we're, uh, we, that's just being published on August 22nd, Dead Mountain, involves uh, uh, a mystery that's actually based on a true mystery about these nine skiers who disappear in the mountains and then their bodies are found. 
uh, having with extremely mysterious uh, under their deaths occurring under very mysterious circumstances, almost inexplicable. Uh, so we that book will be published next month. I would say it stays the same, except that uh, I rely more on Doug for some of the New Mexico scenery. I mean, I, I, I've I went to school in Arizona. I've lived in Arizona um, when I was younger, but Doug knows it much better than I do. And um, other than that, the uh, you know plots are plots wherever they're set. And Doug and I still divide our roles by character or sequence or subplot. I like Nora and I like Corey. I like Corey because I, I was perhaps more instrumental in creating her. Uh, she's kind of a rebel. And at the time we were writing uh, Still Life with Crows, which is where she's introduced, I had a daughter uh, who was about 16 at the time or 17. She was about the same age as Corey. And a little unsure of myself and my ability to write about a 17 year old girl, I asked my daughter, Celine, I said, well, what can, can you tell me about who, who you, what should this girl be like? So Celine, told me about what kind of clothes she wore. Uh, she cut, she burned a CD for me of the music that she listens to. She talked about her goth, you know, aspect because that's one thing about Corey was she in high school, she was kind of a goth, you know, she dressed in that kind of clothing. And, and so my daughter, Celine, really helped me create that character. So ever since then, I've been more uh, a Corey uh, person. And Lincoln, of course, Nora, Kelly um, is an archaeologist, and that character is named after his grandmother. So he's got a big uh, uh, stake in that character, a bigger stake in that character. So that's kind of how that came about. 